Uh, so I'm Paul Stacy. I'm with BC Campus, and it's my honor, actually, to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Richard Baraniak. I first got a chance to meet Richard about uh, five or six years ago, I guess, when we met here in Vancouver just to talk about our respective open educational resource initiatives. And ever since then, Richard's been a personal inspiration for me with his Connections project, so I look forward to hearing this morning about the latest of uh, that particular initiative. As you can see in the program uh, with Richard's bio, he's originally from Winnipeg, so it's kind of neat to have Richard here as a keynote for the Canadian e-learning conference. And I thought rather than just reading what's in the program, I'd dig around on the web a little bit to see what else I could find about Richard. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I found out about him was that uh, prior, for, prior to him going into academics, he he was instrumental lead guitar in forming a number of musical groups, including the Thought Police, High Voltage, and Bourgeoisie. So I, I'd be uh, interested in hearing Richard speak about the efficacy of uh, Guitar Hero as an education technology learning tool, but I think that's going to have to wait. Um, Richard's currently a professor in the Electrical and, and uh, Computer Engineering Department at Rice University in Houston. And uh, his academic work has really been prolific. And as you'll see in the, in the program, the awards for his work have been numerous. Uh, digital, signal, digital signal processing remains a core area of interest. And he's currently doing some really interesting work around a single pixel digital camera. So all of you with cameras and uh, uh, into that whole space might want to talk to him. But of course, we're here today to hear him speak about connections. And Connections was uh, founded by Richard back in 1999, and it's received Hewlett Foundation support over the years. It's really a nonprofit publishing project that aims to bring textbooks and learning materials into the internet age. Uh, Connections makes high quality educational content available to anyone at any time from anywhere, and invites authors, educators, and lear learners worldwide to, to both add to it and make use of it. Each month, uh, Connections has uh, about 850,000 people from 200 countries around the world using the resources on the Connections site. And so please uh, join me in welcoming Richard Braniak. Thank you. So it, great to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, uh, it's great to be back in Canada. It's great to be at such a green conference. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, keeping things green. And I also have a, a, a tour announcement. Uh, after Paul's session today, uh, he and I will be leading a tour down to Rec Beach. Uh, <laughs> pic picnic lunch as well as clothing is optional. OK, so, so we'll be going down about 4 o'clock, I think. Uh, so my job uh, today uh, uh, for the next hour or so is, is really to talk about a bunch of things. One is, is to talk about uh, what is being called open education. There have been a lot of things that have been called open education in the past, and so I'm going to try and uh, tell you more about uh, the, this new, uh, really open source approach to education. And I'm going to uh, also talk not just about this new approach to providing free textbooks and free educational materials to people all, all around the world, but I'm also going to try just a little bit to uh, uh, indicate how ideas like this are starting to have a broader impact on the very institutions that we, you know, all of us work at, namely uh, educational institutions, technology for educational institutions, and how some of these open sourcing ideas uh, and, and the, the business practices behind open education are going to actually uh, be part of the wedge that is going to be driving into uh, changing some of our institutions. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. So hopefully we can have some uh, good discussion about that. Uh, so I'd like to keep things really interactive. There are some, some mics that we can pass around, but also just feel free to stick your hand up at any time and just yell out a question and I'll try my best to repeat it. And then we can keep things, uh, we can deal with a lot of the questions during the talk rather than uh, you having to remember all the way uh, to the end. So is that okay with everybody? Okay, so rule number one of a talk is don't put the slide advancer in your pocket, right? But uh, I, I, I don't want to talk, I want to start not talking about education, but I want to talk a little bit about music, okay? And, and does anybody here like music? Okay, is there anybody who does, have you ever met someone who doesn't like music? 
Okay, very, very rarely. Okay, and what I want just everybody to think about, just as a thought experiment, is about the music world, right? The music world, and in particular, the way the music world has really been flattened, right? Flat. The Earth has been flattened by these uh, uh, digital technologies, like the internet, like the web, like iTunes, that has really united the the musical community into a truly global interactive community, right? It's, it's a community really where everyone is free to create uh, t- t- musical ideas, right? No one stops me from picking up a guitar and, and creating like a new song. Uh, no one stops Paul, I'm going to pick on Paul a lot today, from, from sharing their musical ideas, maybe quoting a little bit of that guitar line in his saxophone solo, right? So really a free sharing of ideas, or maybe quoting a little John Coltrane in his saxophone solo. And then the ability to not just use, but, but reuse in a very, very open way. And because of this, right, the, the uh, musical community, I think you would use these kind of adjectives to describe it. It's a tremendously open and vibrant, very much centered in today and tomorrow, continuously updating uh, musical ideas and very efficiently transmitting them all around the world. I think everyone would agree. Would everyone agree? Okay. I think you would never use these terms on the right to describe the world of textbooks. Right? Never ever. You would use worlds like glacial, stodgy, stovepiped, right? Disconnected, okay, ineffective, I think. And the the precise reason is is that it's at least pre- at present it's very difficult to do these things. Right? To create and share and freely use and 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 reuse educational ideas. And so, as a, and the reason for this, of course, as we know, is that, is that educational ideas of today, at least most of them, are still really, really locked up. And they're locked up because of, in, behind two kinds of locked doors. The first is closed formats, right? Everybody here knows about technology, so we all know how difficult it can be to share ideas across different technological platforms and formats. The second, that's just as important, is closed copyright regime. That, that actually in, in this country and the United States uh, makes it actually illegal in a lot of cases to share educational ideas, right? And actually a lot of the practices that go on amongst faculty and uh, amongst faculty and their students, at least in the United States, some of those practices are a- absolutely illegal, okay? And if the publishers, well, the publishers know they've turned a blind eye, but it's increasingly becoming uh, an issue. So because of this locking up, I think this is one of the main reasons that the, the educational system of today, at least the, the dissemination of ideas, is very inefficient. It, it, it's created a world where learning materials are extremely unaffordable, right? The $200 textbook is already here, right? The $200 textbook. And as a result, not accessible. I mean, when a book costs $200 so that a library can't even afford it, right? The number of people who have access to that material is, is dwindling very, very quickly. And so this idea of open education is really, uh, at, at its base, at its core, trying to take these ideas that, that we talked about in the music world and really try to port those over into textbooks, learning materials, course materials, curricula, right? Creating a world where anyone can create, share, use, and, and reuse educational ideas completely, totally for free. So that's really the really quick introduction. And so what I want to do is, is talk a little bit so about some examples and, and some, some case studies and then talk about the future. So uh, what are the enablers behind this movement? And everybody here is uh, involved in technology, so I can go really quickly. The first, we all know, it is technology. You couldn't do this 20 years ago, right? But with the emergence of the Internet and the web, everybody knows the web makes it very easy for you to deconstruct a textbook into little pieces, Right? That can be reused in many ways and then reconstituted very, very easily. We all know that. Okay? So XML, for example, can provide a common framework, at least the promise of a common framework for sharing. So we can get across this stovepipe platforms problem. And then, of course, we know that the Internet provides virtually free distribution and virtually permanent archival storage. So these are, these are, are very nice things. They've been around, oh, about 10 or 15 uh, years or so in, in, a, in a meaningful way. So here's just an example of what you could imagine as a, uh, an OE, an edu- open education platform. It consists of textbooks, right, regular paper books that have been un- deconstituted, right? Instead of the, the quantum being 300 pages, this book has been broken down into little, say, page or so, uh, uh, what we call modules or people call learning objects, right, that are usable on their own, like a web page, but also uh, 
uh, can, be, can be built in, in, into many different useful structures. So this is like the primordial state of one of these commons. There's a little bit of, here's some architecture material, a little bit of calculus, right, art history over here. It looks like chaos, but everybody in this no room knows that we can use uh, web technologies, databases to, to pull these together into very powerful learning machines, right, very quickly. Uh, 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 build the textbook of today, not only the textbook of today, but the textbook of tomorrow, so that these learning machines can be not only useful today, but also move towards a world where every kid, right, every student can have their own textbook, right? So we can build these so quickly and easily that different kids are going to have a textbook customized to their wants, their needs, their context, their learning outcomes, and their, their learning backgrounds. Right? Not only that, but we can get into a world of reuse, where once we've written the, the de facto really good module on how to use the quadratic formula to factor a second order polynomial, right? there it is right here, we don't have to rewrite that 85,000 times right? for every different calculus and algebra course all around the world. We can actually try and reuse much of that material in many, many different contexts to try to get some economy of scale and, and, and to try to, 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 to move quicker to, and, and broaden the, the area of coverage of, of one of these open education platforms. So, so reuse. So, so technology. Okay? I think everybody here is clear about that. The second thing people might not be quite as familiar about, although there's been a lot of leadership here in British Columbia, is trying to break down this, uh, the intellectual property problems associated with the current copyright regime. And un unfortunately, it's been very, very difficult over the last 10 or 15 years to try to convince uh, governments to change copyright law. And so what has actually happened is a, a, a number of projects have uh, emerged. For example, the GNU Foundation in the United States, Creative Commons uh, around the world, to actually create a parallel universe of content, right? That, that where we, instead of changing copyright law, we use copyright licenses to make content safe to share. And a great example of this I already mentioned is Creative Commons. And let me just get a show of hands. How many people know about Creative Commons? Okay, probably everybody. If you do not, you need to go to creativecommons.org and learn about this. The critical idea is that we're taking inspiration from the open software movement and we are, uh, we are basically applying that to, to develop copyright licenses that make it safe to share educational material. So again, I think most of us are familiar with this. So as a result, combining technology and intellectual property, the idea then, to summarize one last time, is to try to move to, from the pipeline model of developing textbooks today, and it truly is a pipeline if you talk to publishers, much more towards a true ecosystem model where we have continual feedback and improvement of the materials all the way from the content you know, spark of idea of the generation of the content all the way down to the distribution and the use of the content. And increasingly that feedback being based on actual student and user feedback and um, uh, learning outcomes. Has anybody ever here ever written a textbook? Okay. How much feedback did you ever get from other institutions about your textbook? Some. None. Usually it's some to none. Okay. And I know I know people who have published, you know, world changing textbooks that sell hundreds of thousands of copies per year, and their feedback is basically again some to none. They get five emails a month or one email a month about their book. Partly because often people don't even know that they're, you know, allowed to or supposed to contact the author of these textbooks. So, so I think a really important thing to think about is, is, is moving from this pipeline to this uh, ecosystem model and engaging the people who are actually not just, uh, not just developing the content but actually using it in either a classroom or an e-classroom, engaging them in improving and updating the content so that the teaching process actually becomes part of a uh, teaching and, and learning process becomes part of a continual faculty development process or instructor development process. And I'll have more to, to say about that later. Okay, any questions at this point? So let's talk about some, some quick examples. There, there, are, there are lots of them out there now, right? Uh, uh, people here are familiar, I'm sure, with MIT OpenCourseWare project, right, that made access free 
not so open, but actually free to virtually all of the courses in uh, uh, MIT's uh, repertoire. People are also familiar in the far left there with projects like Wikipedia that has spun off sub-projects like Wikiversity, Wikieducator, Wikibooks that are trying to take the same wiki model to develop uh, educational materials. I'll talk a lot about these other projects as we go along. There's been a lot of leadership here uh, in, in, in British Columbia around the BC Commons uh, and developing a, 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 a safe zone where it's safe to share uh, uh, educational content within British Columbia. And I'm going to talk in particular about the project I know best, which is Connections which is a project that I started 10 years ago, nine and a half, 10 years ago, be precisely because I was really basically planning to be a textbook author and realized that, that, that if I was a textbook author, uh, planning to be a textbook author, but realized at the same time that the system I was planning to put my content into, that pipeline, was in fact a broken pipeline, right? Had a leaks all over the place. And instead decided to do something more, a little bit more modern, if you will. So let's just talk briefly about connections. Paul talked about it a lot. We, we have a, a repository of about uh, 11,000 or so of these little mo learning modules. They're woven into about 500 or so courses. And we're getting roughly about a million uh, users per month. And it's growing uh, roughly by about 5, per, five or 10% uh, per month. All of the material in connections is for completely free online. It's actually licensed under the most open Creative Commons license. And I'd like to talk more about this at the end of the talk, the CC BY license, or attribution license. Uh, so all the material is actually freely usable, even commercially usable. And all of the materials can be printed out. We have a very, very sophisticated print-on-demand engine that can actually print out. Uh, you, you have a, a collection composer tool where you can weave together these Lego bo blocks into a, a course and then print that out and have it printed on the exact same printing presses that print all the other textbooks around the world at uh, egregiously low cost. So just to give you a sense, this book is uh, about a 300-page engineering textbook uh, that's used at Rice and a number of other schools around the United States. Uh, it would cost for about $120 from a conventional publisher, and it's uh, $20 through Connections. Okay, 20 bucks. So I'll hand that around. And the idea here is to provide, you know, material not just not just free online because not everybody has access to the web all 24 hours a day, but to also provide ebook reader versions and for people who only have access to print, try to provide the absolute lowest cost. Uh, uh, print version. This is a music textbook. I'll talk more about it in a minute. It's totally beaten up, but uh, it's uh, actually used at a whole bunch of K-12 institutions around the world, and it's uh, like six six dollars, I think. So I'll hand that around. It's really really cool material, but I'll talk more about it later. Okay. So, <laughs> so the architecturally, not going into anything about the architecture, but connections really is has two sides to it. One is a open source software platform that's built on top of Plone and Python, for people who are familiar with that. Uh, and then is the content itself. Most people use connections without even knowing there's an open source platform behind it. But people here might actually be interested in you know, uh, uh, getting involved in the, the development of that or the, the, um, uh, the using that at, at your institution. So it's very simple. It's a, a, a basically a repository uh, built on Plone that, that uh, everything is Creative Commons CC BY licensed. Uh, it has version control, so all of the materials are version control, so you can lock in particular versions. You can sort through them in all different ways. Uh, it's very easy for people to, to edit, to fork off copies of, of materials and edit those, personalize them, translate them, etc. And then it's very easy to push out print versions, uh, 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 PDF versions, or for in some cases, L, uh, versions that can be integrated into an LMS. So it's just architecturally very, very uh, simply what, what's going on. So I'm going to talk about two kinds of users. The first are institutional users, big users, and the second are uh, smaller uh, uh, community type users. So the first project that I'd like to talk about is very closely related to this very, very hot issue now, which is the extraordinarily high cost of learning materials. And this, uh, the uh, um, Community College Open Textbook Project was uh, founded out of uh, Foothill De Anza Community College in uh, California, in the Bay Area of California, by a visionary uh, chancellor named Martha Cantor, who is uh, actually on, 
in the confirmation process to become under Secretary of Education in the, United Sta in the United States. And the problem that they're trying to address is the fact that the way tuition is structured in California for community college, and I, I think it's very, very similar in, in Canada, the actual price of textbooks will very often exceed the price of the tuition. Okay? And what that means is that when a kid is dropping out of community college, right, they are dropping out as much because of the cost of their books as because of the high cost of tuition. And the state only has leverage on the cost of tuition, so they're having less and less chance to impact the price of an education and make it more affordable for people in their, in their states or in their provinces. And so the CCOTP project is a, a project now comprising almost 100 now community colleges across Canada and the U.S., that, and basically, the, the, these community colleges have banded together to create open and free textbooks, completely free textbooks for the entire uh, uh, top 20 courses that are most taken at these community colleges, okay? so the, where the pinch is really being felt the most. And uh, they're making good progress. There are a number of different open textbook projects that are involved in this, providing content. Uh, the very first book that's uh, already been in, in use for one year is a book called Collaborative Statistics that's used in a, a course called Math One in, uh, in California. But uh, it, it goes by all different names at community colleges around Canada and the U.S. Just to give you a sense, uh, that book is a 630-page statistics book, non-calculus-based uh, statistics book, uh, it used to sell for well over $100, and uh, it's completely free online now, and it's uh, $31, like, for the print version through Connections. Okay, so, so basically a factor of, of three to four cheaper, or four to five, rather, uh, cheaper uh, uh, materials for students uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Another example is the government of Vietnam. Okay, you want to talk about something being broken. The educational system in Vietnam is completely broken. Uh, and they d looked at various means to try to improve their educational system. And what they realized is that the only way they could really do it was not by a top-down approach, but rather by a combination top-down, bottom-up approach where they try to engage their faculty in materials development as a faculty development strategy rather than just providing with them with materials, okay, translated materials from somewhere else. So they've actually deployed connections across 40 universities uh, in Vietnam to actually not just use as a platform to disseminate material, but also as a platform to, to actively develop new materials for the country of Vietnam. So that's something we're pretty excited about. You can go to vocw.vn uh, to find that particular project. Another project, again, related to things that are broken, I think that's one of the themes of, of today's talk, is the South African curriculum that again has severe, severe problems, not only uh, with cost, accessibility, but also quality. And so uh, Mark Shuttleworth, a very, very interesting guy, decided to take some matters into his own hands. People heard of Mark Shuttleworth, first space tourist, okay? Anybody here use Ubuntu, okay? He is the guy behind the Ubuntu Windows Manager for Linux, which is really the best, uh, I would say, uh, Windows Manager out there. Uh, he basically took matters into his own hands. He actually developed a team of authors across South Africa, and he purchased a publisher of K-12 educational content, and they uh, then decided that they would deploy all of this content under a CC BY license, the most open Creative Commons license, and then they partnered with us, Connections, earlier uh, this year. And so all of that material is now starting to come out in Connections. So the plan is a complete end-to-end K-12 curriculum, starting in mathematics and sciences and moving into other areas, and they expect to be finished over about the next two years. And this material is already starting to get used at some institutions in in the U.S. and Canada. It's very high quality, and we expect to see a, a really a lot of the use of this, not just in the initial South African impact zone, but all around the world. Okay, last big uh, uh, institutional user is the IEEE. The IEEE is, happens to be my professional society. It's the Electrical Engineering Professional Society. It's actually the world's largest professional society. Uh, and in addition to offering really cheap uh, life insurance, right, like professional societies do. Uh, they also publish a fleet of top journals, a t fleet of top journals that are targeted at PhD level researchers, 
but they are now very, very interested in getting involved in engineering education. And engineering education, not just at the college level, but at the high school level. Because there is also a crisis in both of our countries of not enough, well, both, yeah, both Canada and the U.S., of not enough kids going into engineering, right? And so professional societies are actually starting to take matters into their own hands and trying to develop really interesting uh, curricular materials around uh, things like Lego Mindstorms, around robotics, around biotechnology, to show kids that science and engineering and math is actually really cool, that there's a career path. And so IEEE has realized that the best way for them to try to do this is through open education, by making the materials free and really high quality so that it's basically a no-brainer for science and math teachers around the world to be able to pick those up and integrate into their curricula. Okay, So that's an interesting outreach project from the IEEE. The other thing that's really interesting is because they have a, a, a very high quality bar for everything that they do within their society, they've actually become very interested in the quality review of educational materials in general and open educational materials in particular. And so I'm going to talk at length about quality review of open ed, ed materials. Everybody's heard the debates about Wikipedia versus Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica. Show of hands. Okay, you might fall on one side or the other to the debate. So we're going to talk at, at length about uh, quality review of any kind of open material or any kind of web-based uh, material more towards uh, the end of the talk. So that's big institutional in, uh, in, in people who are involved. Let's talk more about some specific case studies of, of smaller groups and individuals who are getting involved in open education. So a great example within, actually now within the umbrella of this IEEE project is, is a bunch of engineering professors, pretty much just like me, who about 10 years ago were also realizing that they were disenchanted with the state of teaching signal processing which is a particular area within electrical engineering. And faculty at all of these different institutions were thinking of writing their own book, right? That's what academics do, right? We, we, we get unhappy, right? Anytime we get unhappy with the status quo, we think of how we can change it. And in, in the education space, really the only way to try to change things is to, to write your own book. So about 10 years ago, all these people thought of writing their own book. About the same time, they all realized their impact would be minimal. Right? Because a, a sort of successful engineering textbook uh, in the upper levels, right, uh, 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 junior, senior, or grad level, will have a run, print run of maybe 2,000 copies a year. Okay? If you calculate out in your head, the number of royalties for that is piddling. Right? It like, works out to about 25 cents an hour when you amortize over the amount of time that you invest in writing the book. Right? Uh, and the book run will probably be three, two, three, four years, and then it will fall out of the catalog and be out of print, and, and the, you'll feel burned, right? So all these people knew this was going to happen. So instead of writing a, their own book, what we did was band together, right, into an informal community and decided that we would, instead of each writing our own book, we would together write a super textbook, right, a, say about a 1,000 pages of material, that could uh, be used to create a customized book for each one of these schools. Realizing that about 85 to 90% of each of these books will actually be the same. Because they have to carry, carry the, cover the same fundamental core material. But then about 15, 10 to 15% of the material will be different at each individual school. And that can be pulled out of the super textbook and, and customized for each individual institution. This uh, uh, super text is nearing completion. It's actually a lot of the materials undergoing peer review. Uh, by the IEEE, and now it's actually been picked up and supported uh, by a project in, in the National, National Science Foundation in the U.S. So that's an example of a th like efficiency, right? Using the web to, and, and op uh, idea, open ideas, share, e making it really easy to share, to be, to be more efficient doing the same kind of thing. Like call it textbook 2.0, right? It's just more efficient textbook. A, a nice advantage of these materials is because they're all open access, it's very easy for people to get involved in re recontextualize them. And a great example of, one example of recontextualization I already mentioned is customizing the book that's used at Stanford for Illinois, right? For Illinois. The other is translation. And a, a really nice example of this is uh, about a year after the super textbook started and actually a, a, a bunch of the materials were in there, three uh, grad students at the University of Texas El Paso decided that they wanted to get involved. They were all engineering graduate students. 
they did not feel comfortable starting from scratch and writing their own educational materials. So what they decided to do was translate, translate from English into Spanish. Okay? So they spent the summer doing this as a volunteer project. Within a week of publishing their material in Connections, it was in the top 10 most popular. It remains in the top 10 most popular. And just to give you a sense, my particular book in Connections is four times more popular in Spanish than in English. And that is the kind of uh, a tremendous outreach that a regular publisher is just completely uneconomic for a regular publisher. The only textbook that, textbooks that get translated into other languages are those blockbuster books. Okay, so, so there's no way that a regular publisher would ever be able to offer to me uh, uh, that they would publish the book other than that I would pay for it and it would come out of my revenue, right, my royalty stream. So again, economic forces. We'll talk about this later. The American Society for Engineering Education has now become involved and they are working towards uh, uh, developing four communities of educators to develop four parallel engineering curricula in the four primary languages of North and South America, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and English. And this is something we're hoping to roll out over the next uh, couple years or so. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty exciting. So the, 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 these are the kind of usual people you might think to get involved in education. College educators, right? Grad students. But I'm much more interested actually in the people that I call shutouts. Right? The people who would never be the kind of people that would write a textbook. Undergraduate students. Okay? High school students. People like Kitty Schmidt-Jones who's a private music teacher in Champaign, Illinois, uh, whose husband actually is one of those super textbook authors, right, who came home one night and said, wow, we're going to do connections, and we're going to revolutionize engineering education. Oh, come on. You know, she told her husband, that's boring, right, engineering, right? Like, music is where it's at. Because music, or you talk about passion, right? You have, to, you have to work on what you're passionate about. But her point was a really good one, that music is really a door that opens so many, uh, uh, opens to so many areas, right? Opens to mathematics, to physics, and to engineering. And not only that, the, the music theory uh, teaching, at least in the U.S., is, is absolutely in a crisis mode because it's precisely the music curriculum that's the first curriculum that's cut, whose budget is cut when a school has to cut their budget, leaving the teachers to fend on their own, to, to either buy the stuff, buy the music materials on their own, or to get it off the web. And she was really concerned about the quality of the materials that were out there on the web. So she's a private music teacher. She's never the kind of person who would be a textbook type author. But she had really, really nice ideas on how to teach music to kids in especially K through 8. So she started to contribute to Connections. Okay? And, and, and she was very, very surprised at, at, at the results. Okay? Sunil Singh is another interesting story. right? He's an engineer and a parent. He's a pe uh, process engineer for... Um, uh, process engineer for petrochemical plants, and he was tutoring his kids physics, right? And he, anybody here, here help your kids with their homework, right? And he realized that the textbook was wrong, right? So they had mixed up centripetal and centrifugal force, all kinds of problems. And so what he started to do is he started to write his own handwritten notes, right, to s explain things maybe correctly and maybe also with a different spin that, that his kids resonated with. These started to be photocopied, right, around his school, reused in all kinds of different ways. And so we looked for a way to scale this up. He started to put his stuff into connections. So where Kitty and, and Sunil t uh, sing today, they've become like rock stars of, of, of education. Kitty's stuff has been used 15, time, 15 million times to date. It's in the official curriculum in, in Mongolia. Okay? It's used all across institutions in, in the United States and Canada. Sunil Singh is more popular in the United States than in India. Okay? Again, these are people we call shutouts. These are people that you would never think of as contributing to an engineer, uh, to some kind of uh, uh, curricular project. And the really, really neat news is, is, that, is that there are way more people outside the system than inside the system with fabulous uh, educational ideas to share. And I think the way to summarize this is we, we think too often about projects that we're doing and projects like ed open education, in really specifically, as a great outreach effort. And, and a classic example, perfect example is MIT OpenCourseWare. We are going to outreach, provide access to all of our materials to people around the world, right? 
And I think the really tremendous power of open education is not the outreach of our materials, but it's, this, it's precisely this, this in-reach, right, from parents, from engineers and scientists in industry, from just concerned people around the world who have tremendous educational ideas to share and who, if they're only allowed to contribute, can tremendously enrich the educational experience for, for everyone around the world. So I'm, re I'm really excited about these, these ideas of, of in-reach and trying to make it easier for people around the world to contribute to projects like you know, open education projects in general. So hopefully everybody can see that there are a lot of opportunities Right? Opportunities for educational materials that are free, that are highly accessible, that are, that are it, due to the community culture in which they're developed, can be very high quality, can be archived forever. Right? So your book never goes out of print. And not only does it never go out of print, but if you find a typo, it can be fixed in 10 minutes. So that when we realize that Pluto is no longer a planet, Right? We can have it fixed so that it's out of the nation's textbooks not 10 years from now, right? but like tomorrow. Because the problem with 10 years from now, as it's really going to take, literally, in the U.S. and Canada to get Pluto out of the textbooks, by the time that happens, guess what? Right? Astronomers will have figured out that something about the orbit means it should be a planet, and we need to put it back in. Right? So it's precisely this problem right, of, of, of the slow time scales that, 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 that really de-enriches our, our uh, uh, educational process. And, of course, the tremendous democratization that, that open education provide. So let, let's talk about the road ahead. And I think I probably have like 20 minutes or half hour or what? Yeah, okay. So let's talk about the road ahead. Where are things going? Sort of just short term and then long term and much, much longer term. So what are, we, what are we seeing as some of the impacts? Well, the first is uh, everything I've been talking about up to now is I'm handed around a paper textbook, right? That's so yesterday, right? People in this audience know that, that, that the real power of, of uh, web-based technologies is moving from a, a C culture to a do culture, right? Where we can actually have immersion, right, in an educational space and where people can actually interact and do things and get f constant feedback on that rather than just reading about it, right? And, and I don't need to convince anybody in this room that this is very, very powerful. And the good news is, is that uh, because so many of these open education projects have had to be st stood up, right, st started up from scratch, at least some of them are, 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 are predisposing themselves to, to, to be in a... In a, a what am I saying? Predisposing themselves so that they can, interactivity can come sooner rather than later. Because as everybody knows here, interactivity is very expensive, right? It's very expensive, very painstaking, very time consuming. And that the key idea here is that since the open materials are open, you can also start to make some of the interactive elements also open source, make them very easy for pe communities of people to develop and share. So just an example of connections, the way that we sort of just very luckily set things up way back in 1999 that's starting to pay off today. We had a need to show mathematics on the web, and we refused to show mathematics as a JPEG of a, you know, a picture of math. We just refused to do that. And so we were actually one of the first uh, groups that started using MathML back in 1999. Okay? This was extremely outrageously risky at that time. And the, the, way, the reason it's paying off is that all the, the formulas in connections that are encoded in what's called content MathML, those can actually be dragged and dropped directly from connections into a tool like Mathematica, and they work. So it means that all the formulas in, in a good number of our mathematics and engineering materials actually are set up so that they are, are really interactivity ready. Right? All we need to do is build the right tools uh, in things like Mathematica and other, tool, and other uh, mathematical engines so that we can make connections and other projects clickable so that while you're tutoring your kid's algebra, every single formula, you'll just be able to click on it and bring up a little thing to play with it, interact with it, understand it visually or you know, otherwise. Right? So very, very, very powerful. In our case, it was very lucky uh, that we, we, we adopted MathML, but a lot of other projects are start, starting to develop uh, uh, examples like this. And people are probably familiar with search engines like Wolfram Alpha, show of hands, okay? Heavily based on things like XML metadata markup, 
uh, 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 I think uh, Wolfram may not be the world's most open company, uh, but they are extremely far ahead as far as semantic use of semantic uh, markup and and understanding for uh, um, uh, mathematics and other uh, technical areas. And of course, this is uh, mathematics, but the same kind of markup languages exist for for music, for physics, for chemistry. CML markup language for, for chemistry actually encodes not only the, the formula, right, the chemistry formulae, but it even encodes how the molecules fit together. So it's very, very powerful for being able to visualize, play with, understand that if you build a, ma a, a chemistry formula that it doesn't balance right or that it, it's going to be unstable, right? All this stuff is being built into the, these open educational materials, so they're really interactivity ready. So that's one important, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, movement uh, of, of things. The second is, tied in with, with this, is an increasingly increasing interplay between open science and open education. How many show of hands? I like shows of hands, but sort of clicker, but cheapo clicker. Are you familiar with uh, open science? Okay, what is the open science movement? It's a movement... That, that encompasses a whole bunch of things, okay, including things like reproducible research. Namely, that if you publish a paper that has a hypothesis and has software that, that shows that your idea confirms or disproves some hypothesis, that software should actually be made available along with the paper, right? Or if you collect data and you're able to make a, a, a conclusion, that data should also be open you know, so that people can actually start to you know, and analyze all of this, right? Figure out if your statistical analysis, is the hockey stick really there or not there, right? For example, that's a great example of closed data, right? The hockey stick, people know about the hockey stick, global warming hockey stick, right? It really, people know about this, right? The hockey stick, right? Global warming, from Canada, actually. Uh, <laughs> that's why they call it the hockey stick, right? But basically, the uh, people in, in uh, you know, a number of uh, climatologists in Canada who realized that the, the climate, uh, world temperatures had actually gone through a phase transition and were on the rise and going to continue to rise. And the reason, one of the reasons why this was not, uh, there's been, how, this was 10 years, longer than 10 years ago that they announced this. The reason it's taken so long for many professional organizations and governments to finally agree is that these climatologists zealously guarded their data. You know, they say, we have, there is a hockey stick, but you're not looking at my data. So, so are people going to agree or not, right? So, 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 th so this is an idea of trying to move science forward more on a, a much more rapid scale, or rapid time scale, by trying to make things open. And, and uh, another a very important thing is trying to open access to, edu uh, to, to scientific results. I'm probably going off into too many tangents now. I think my half hour is dwindling. Uh, but there, there's a very, very important law that was passed in, uh, in Canada, uh, or, sorry, in the United States, and I think a similar law is under in the works here in Canada that, that is basically uh, related to open access to medical research results. Okay, a big pr this is a hot button issue because you could just imagine if you had a, some weird disease or some cancer and you're a person that knows about science, what are you going to think about? Well, knows about science or doesn't know about science. You're going to go educate yourself. And you're going to want to learn about the latest cutting edge results and techniques to cure your cancer. The problem is, is that at least until recently in the United States, these re latest results might be in journals where one single issue of that journal costs $2,000, right? Or a yearly subscription is, is $27,000. So do you think your local library is going to carry, you know, sell, right? They're not going to carry that journal, right? And so the, the law was really uh, developed by a, a, a coalition of scientists who wanted to see open science happen, but also concerned individuals from the community who wanted to see a freer spread of scientific ideas. And basically what it comes down to is what's called the o open access mandate. Oh, well, let me just say, here's, there was an initiative uh, started in Budapest uh, that was signed by a whole bunch of Nobel Prize winners that ended up in legislation called the Open Access 
uh, open access mandate that says that if you're a researcher, researcher in the United States working in medicine and your research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, who funds virtually all the science in medicine research in the United States, then no matter where you published your journal article, within six months of publishing that journal article, you must put that article into an open access database. So it's free for anyone in the world to access for eternity. Okay, which they were actually able to push through Congress and was a major advance. Like I said, similar legislation is trying to be worked through in Canada and the Wellcome Trust in uh, the uh, UK that funds a lot of the uh, 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 medical work in, in the UK has a, a similar, actually identical uh, uh, mandate. So there's actually growing uh, uh, support now for something called the Cape Town Declaration, which is a parallel declaration for educators to try to push through open access mandates in countries all around the world that, that actually say that educational materials are a public good and that the educational materials that are developed using government funding. Anybody here get government funding to develop educational materials? Okay. That these are a public good. They have been paid for by the government. So paid for by taxpayer money that the, the, the world should have, the taxpayers should have access to these materials. Okay? And this might seem like a radical concept. BC is actually taking a big step in this direction with the BC Commons, saying that BC taxpayers should have access, BC people. But, but eventually, this is going to be much, much more broad scale. And I I'd invite everybody, it's at the end of my talk, but invite everybody to go to Cape Town Declaration, read it, sign it, get your educational institution to sign it. So this is actually prompting legislation. So people probably heard about Schwarzenegger, right, uh, last week. Right, coming out and saying California is going to go whole hog into e-textbooks. Anybody hear that? And literally quoted that there's all kinds of really good stuff in a lot of open access projects that we can use. So that we'll provide like e-book readers or something like that. And then we'll actually, it's possible now for projects like Connections and other projects to actually contribute materials to a repository and have them reviewed by the California Board of Education, have them actually get out there and get used. There's a lot of controversy about what this is actually going to, whether it's really going to improve anything in California, whether it's really just dipping from the technology pot, right, to use it for the textbook pot, right, because California, if you hadn't noticed, California is totally bankrupt, right? But there is a, a, a lot going on in the state of Washington, Virginia, Ohio, Illinois, a lot of states that are actually getting involved in not just e-textbook initiatives, but open access initiatives. The most exciting and farthest reaching one is actually a bill that's being developed right now that would do exactly what I just talked about. That would be an open access mandate that would say if you are an educator in the U.S. and you have a grant, to, and part of that grant is to develop educational materials, and it's a government grant, you must make those materials open access, okay? Which would be very, very far reaching. And the really interesting thing about this, and we can talk about it later in the Q&A, is that the license that was selected is the CC BY license, the Creative Commons Attribution License, the most open license. And the reason that that license was adopted is because that is really the only license that really tries to bring the publishers into this community. Right? And we could, let's, I'll put it off to the Q&A, but I'm a, big, uh, I, I'm a big supporter of CC BY and a little bit CC BY SA. I'm a big negative man on non-commercial licensing. So if you can try and attack, you know, attack me at the end of the, end of the talk about that. The problem with non-commercial licenses is that they basically set up a confrontation with publishers. Because they say, you can't touch this stuff, we're going to develop it outside of you, and we're going to try and put you out of business, basically. CC BY actually brings everyone together in a community. So it's very exciting. We'll see. We're still going to get attacked, right, by the publishers, obviously. Uh, the Dutch have gone even further. They have an open access mandate called WikiWise that was dreamed up by the Minister of Education, and it's actually gone to law. And so starting September, they will actually be prototyping uh, the, uh, an open access platform to K-12 through that will be CC BY licensed, uh, that will involve not just a whole bunch of content, but will require and, and uh, teachers in, in K-12 institutions in Holland to actually get involved on a daily, weekly basis, tending to and improving this commons of material. So very, very exciting. A bunch of other co uh, countries like Poland uh, are also investigating very, very uh, heavily into OE-type uh, mandates.
Okay, so that's legislation. So let's talk about money, right? Talk about money because everybody always asks, right? Open education, totally free. How are you going to sustain this? Or rather, I'm a textbook author. Where are my royalties, right? So money is very, very important. Well, let's talk about sustainability first. Uh, Paul mentioned that we've had gracious support from the Hewlett Foundation, right? Uh, uh, Connections has over the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, that You can't expect that funding to go on forever, right? Uh, so how will projects like Connections support themselves into the long term, right? Because the last thing we want is people to contribute to these projects and then have them disappear, right? That would We'd be breaking our promise of being... Uh, having material free online forever. So the question is always sustainability. But I will say that this is really the wrong question. Okay? The question is not, is open access and is open education sustainable? The question is really, is the status quo sustainable? And you don't have to think hard to see it is completely unsustainable. Prices of textbooks have risen four times faster than inflation over the last decade. We are already in the zone of $200 textbook. We are very close to the zone of the $400 textbook. Okay, this is completely unscalable. The publishers know this. Okay, basically they're pricing themselves out of the market, and it will collapse. It will be a market collapse. Okay, and there are, as you would imagine, there are different kinds of publishers. Publishers who understand this, and still aren't going to change. Publishers who understand this, and then publishers who are actually thinking of of changing. And I think you don't need. You can just get some very very nice business cases for thinking about where the education industry, and it really is an industry that we're in, is going by just looking at all of the other industries that are already either been or, ha or are currently being completely revolutionized by earth-flattening internet technologies, right? The music world, right? Things like music sharing, file sharing, iTunes, computer hardware and software. Does anybody re remember Apollo Computer? Right? Does anybody remember that IBM used to sell computers? Right? Okay. Uh, a software. And another great example, the newspaper industry. Right? Newspapers going broke left and right. Okay? Some people predict the only uh, American papers that will, there will only be like five or six American papers left. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, LA uh, Times. All the rest are going to have to change their business model or go broke. In the meantime, Craigslist this uh, last week, it, an independent analysis assessed that Craigslist will will make a hundred million dollars in profit this year. Okay, hundred million dollars in profit. They have a staff of twenty-five. Okay, so n newspapers is actually the most disruptive, uh, I think, uh, 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 example. But all of the things that you n see happening or have happened in these worlds are going to happen here. There's just no question that th <coughs> excuse me, that these <coughs> business practices are going to come in, in here. So what does this mean and why? Okay? The first thing is that publishing is a long-tail business. Okay? Pardon me? Well, yeah, exactly. Totally. Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I put... Incidentally, let me just mention that my, uh, my, uh, my two-year-old, so I live in Houston, right, which is diametrically opposite climate-wise to Canada, especially Winnipeg, and my two-year-old son is just completely addicted to hockey, and uh, hockey goalie in particular. So he spends every morning watching YouTube hockey goalie training videos, right? <laughs> so <coughs> anyway, we'll talk about hockey later. <coughs> Excuse me. So the important thing about everybody, when they think about writing a textbook, thinks, I'm going to be the, you know, I'm going to write Harry Potter of economics, right? But, uh, but of course, they're writing a book about hypergeometric partial differential equations, <laughs> right? That is not selling millions of copies a year. It's selling five copies a year, right? Six, this, this area is completely economic for big box, big box retailers, for brick and mortar publishers, right? Barnes and Noble is the perfect place, right, for that kind of publisher. Compl but once you get far enough down this curve, and it's really not very far, it's totally un uneconomic. And the problem is, this is most of educational publishing. And in particular, as we move to where we have to reach out to more and more diverse populations, 
this is pushing us even further down this tail. And this is exactly, like five minutes, okay. It's exactly like the music industry, right? Musicians out there think, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to be Madonna, right? And in fact, they're not, right? There's a lot of us love music by a lot of different groups, right? And most of the music that people like actually lives out there in that long tail. Anybody know who this is? Leningrad Cowboys? No? Okay, extremely good band, okay? Uh, okay. Anyway, so in fact, the whole point is that the, the, uh, in the textbook industry and in the music industry, where people think money is, it really isn't. Okay, Pe a lot of people think, oh, those fat cat publishers, oh, those fat cat authors with all their royalties. That is just totally not where the money's actually going. It's not going necessarily into the pockets of the publishers or into the pockets of the, well, all publishers, or the pockets of the authors, okay? And so let's just look at music uh, 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 and talk about, um, uh, I'm going to go over. I hope I don't go over too much. Radiohead, any Radiohead fans? Okay, very brief story, right? They had an album no, recorded and no record contract. So what did they do? Most bands would sign, you know, get a bidding war and sign a record contract. Instead, they did an experiment. They put their record up online, basically for free. But they, they made it pay as you like. So, they put, so basically there's an MP3 file you could download, and then it was like a little box. You type in how many pounds you want to send them. You could put in zero. Okay? What they found is first, the average person put five, uh, five pounds. Okay? I put five pounds. Second, they made millions of dollars in the first week, which was more than all of their iTunes download revenue combined, from all their albums combined. Next, they signed a record contract that was even larger than they ever expected because they had so many people. They, they could still sell a record contract even though they had the MP3 file is still available for free on the web. And finally, when their record came out, it was number one on the Billboard charts. Okay, it's a totally different model. So Tom York uh, from Radiohead and David Byrne, if you recognize them here, from Talking Heads, wrote a fabulous article in Wired Magazine that I'd say everybody here needs to read. It's called The Six, uh, it's called The Real Value, Where's the Real Value of Music? And they propose six business models that are totally different than today's music business models that are viable for the future. These are six educational materials development business models, like just Mutate mutandis, whatever. Just translate the music to textbooks. They all apply. Okay? Uh, and, and, and here is one of them. Okay? Another example, Madonna. Okay, Madonna, without a record contract. What did she do? Did she sign a new record contract with, say, Warner Brothers? They all wanted her to. Who did she sign with? Her touring company. Madonna does not have a record company. She has, a, she has an all-exclusive deal with her touring company. Why does she do that? Because musicians don't make money from CDs. Everybody thinks they do. She makes no money. All, and it's a lost leader to get people to go to her shows. She makes an insane amount of money from concerts. And so it only makes sense that she would sign a deal with her tour promoter rather than her record company. The band that, who, what is the band that figured this out first? Anybody or any old people here? Band that figured this out first. The world's first open source band. Who was it? The Grateful Dead. Because they would basically, they had albums, but they would let anybody bootleg their concerts. They would let people set up fabulous recording systems, even plug into the mixing board to get the best possible bootlegs. Why? Because the, they figured the more people who heard their music, the more people would go to their concerts. And they were totally right. They toured year-round, and they made an insane amount of money from that, okay? So, so just the thing you need to realize is that the money isn't where you might think the money is. Chris Anderson wrote a fabulous article that really brings all this together called Why Zero Dollars is the Future of Business. And this is actually going to be his next book. He wrote The Long Tail, right? Book, fabulous book. Should have been called The Hockey Stick, right? But it calls The Long Tail. And uh, just quick examples about this. Are you going to let me go five minutes over? Okay. First example, Gillette Razors. Right? Razor blades. They, Gillette was brilliant. He invented this years ago. Give away the razor, sell the blades. Even better example, who's ever built, bought an HP printer? <laughs> right? That is the business model. They sell you the printer below cost. It is below their manufacturing cost or right at cost. And then you're addicted, man, right? It's like crack cocaine. 
right? It's the exact same thing. That is one of these models. Okay, so why does this work? What, what is the relationship with open, open education? Well, the important thing is that, and there's a lot of debate about this, but open education can be, okay, can be. If you're CC BY or CC BY SA, not if you're MIT Open Courseware, but if you're CC BY or CC BY SA, you're totally compatible with the publishing world. And what that means is that you, are, you can get a Linux kind of thing going with your open, open education content. Everybody here knows about Linux. You could download Linux for free, but how do most people, actually institutional uh, institutions, get Linux? Do they download it for free? They actually don't. They buy it from Red Hat. They pay 90 bucks a seat or 50 bucks a seat or 20 bucks a seat. Why would you pay money <coughs> for something that's free? Well, it's because Red Hat adds a lot of value. It comes in a DVD. Instead of sitting there 18 hours over your you know, DSL connection downloading the kernel, right? it's right there in a DVD. Second, when it doesn't install right, there's a 1-800 number to call. Third, if it didn't work, you have someone you can sue right? or, or complain to. Right? And, and not only that, they bundle it nicely. They add in a lot of extra goodies. They made, I think, uh, $600 million in revenue last year, doing nothing but selling free stuff. Okay? But it's stuff people want to pay for, right? They add value. Okay? Other examples. That book that we passed around, okay, was completely free online. But then I said it's 20 bucks in print. Why isn't it free in print? It's not free because paper costs money. Right? UPSing it or FedExing it to you costs money. So there are actually companies emerging like Lulu.com you might have heard of, Coop you might not heard of, who are actually on-demand printers. So that book that you saw is not offset print in a run of thousand and sit in a warehouse somewhere. The books and connections are printed one at a time. Okay, print on demand and stuck in a UPS or FedEx bag and, and, and mail to you. Okay, why is this possible? Because all the printers in Ontario and the big print digital print, print machines in Ontario, Hudson Valley in the America uh, in the states and Ohio Valley in the states are now all digitized and the cost of printing a book is insensitive to the volume until you get to really big volumes like thousands and thousands okay which means wh what Coop basically does and I'm going in a sidelight sorry but what they do is they run a reverse auction so when that book, when the PDF file of that, of, of that connections book shows up on Coop server, they have contracts with every big printing house. And they basically say, you tell us how, much you're, how cheap you're going to print this for. Lowest one wins. Okay? This is a tremendous service to us, right? Because basically what they're doing is acting as a broker to try to get that book published as cheaply as possible. Okay, which is that's why we can do it for 20 or 21 uh, dollars. Okay, other examples you might have on your campus one of these book machines, right? Soon you'll have one in every campus bookstore, for example, or library. Five minutes and a book pops out the other end. Okay, this is also something that people, you know, th there's money there. You have to buy this uh, machine. And then last, you might be interested in an interesting model called Flat World Knowledge that is uh, an actual publisher that is really trying to be a red hat. Right? They're really trying to actually have a completely open access model, but then sell the stuff around the model. Flashcards, study guides, you know, Cole's notes, that kind of that kind of thing. Okay, so there are a lot of press about them right now. So that so these are our red hat kind of things. I'm gonna not talk about university presses, but there's a really interesting hybrid presses where you're a a, a for profit or nonprofit press, but then you have a completely open access side. No time to talk. I'm gonna end. Oh, and actually, I really need to end, right? Wow, I'm way over time. Quality control. Let me just say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down here to normally don't have to do this, but I went off in too many asides. Let me just say that you can actually have your cake and eat it too by uh, uh, having it. Uh, uh, the problem with quality control is it doesn't scale, right? And we can have an open access repository where we submit material for peer review. How long does peer review take? Anybody know? Years, right? Time scale of years, which is useless for an open access repository. We can have a completely free and open access repository, but then we have a layer around the repository in, in connections that allows arbitrary third parties to basically have control of a filter into that content. So you can have like the, the cnx.org slash UBC lens that, 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 let, that filters out 
all of the content except the material that, that is of interest or, or high enough quality to be used at UBC. And the important thing is that one repository like Connections can support an arbitrary number of these lenses, if you will, so that we can actually decouple and, uh, the, the, the peer review from the repository and actually make it scalable. And I'd like, I can talk with people about that at the break uh, if they're interested. Okay? Uh, so let me just wrap up. Okay, so uh, wrap up by talking about threats. And do I have like two, two minutes to wrap up? Okay, so, so threats. So, so uh, what is it about, yeah, this is terrible, right? It's called abuse of the organizers, right? Uh, what is it about open, open education like, that, that, that is really makes it tick? Well, the first is disintermediation. Cut out the middleman, Craigslist, perfect example, right? A staff of 20 tw uh, uh, t or 25 can handle an entire world's worth of well, uh, classified ads. The second is disaggregation, right? Letting Coop handle the printing, letting Connections handle the repository, and letting IEEE handle the peer review. Breaking apart the, the or unbundling the various aspects. So you might, <coughs> people might ask, is this going to happen to colleges and universities? And as you, you know, the question is not will it, it's when is this going to happen, right? And this is the thing that you might view as like scary, right? Our universities are the, the, the classic example of an aggregated institution. So let's talk about disintermediation. You might have read like two weeks ago, big press release, the UN has started a university. Okay, Wikiversity has tried to do this. There have been some other attempts. But uh, when you go to the MIT OpenCourseWare site, the big bold-faced letters it says, this is not an MIT education, right? Don't confuse open materials with an education, with a certification. The U of N is UN is going all the way tuition-free online university that's going to certify people the world over. It's going to run on open educational resources. It's going to run on e-technology, right? Distributed classrooms, distributed mentoring, distributed lecturing, and they're actually going to grant degrees, okay? You might view this as a, tr you know, tremendous outreach to the rest of the world, but this is going to be really good stuff, okay? And it is going to threaten, right? I could take a you know, psychology degree and it's going to cost me $30,000 in the States or I could get this UN degree and there's all kinds of companies and professional societies behind it. Very potentially scary. Okay? The other is disaggregation. The university and the college is a pipeline. Totally aggregated, vertically integrated thing. Right? That, that inputs students into the pipeline, kicks out graduates. Right? Open education is just the start peeling off the learning materials part and, and, and disaggregating that, right? But we're seeing things like iTunes U for lecturing, other kind of distributed mentoring kind of projects, professional societies getting involved in credentialing. What is going to happen to our universities? Are they going to just be unbundled, right? That might be scary, right? It might be good. It might be, might be actually scary. So I'll end. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities, obviously, from open education, but also you know, potential threats uh, to the very institutions that we, that we uh, work at. I'll end here saying uh, just get involved. Uh, talk to me about it. Use the course. Tell your colleagues about it. Uh, join a, get your institution to join a consortium and actually in, get involved in projects like Connections or other open access uh, 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 platforms. And I think I will end right there. I promise. Thank you.